Awesome. Hi, Ambal. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Uh, Michelle? I'm awesome. I'm so excited that you're here. I was telling all of our former colleagues uh, that I was going to get to interview the man today. <laughs> so we might see some people okay. popping up and chatting with us that you might remember. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to talk about leading powerfully during COVID. Um, I'm so grateful that you said yes to joining me today on Michelle's Conversations That Matter. Um, so you and I go back many, many years. We worked together. Um, gosh, it feels like forever ago. But I have always appreciated you and your leadership style, watching your career grow. You just like blow my mind with everything that you've accomplished and what you do. So. Um, could you introduce yourself, Emba, to the audience? And I know you're having some video issues, so at least we see your picture. I am. Could you introduce yeah. yourself, who you are, where you live, and what you do? Sure. Thank you, Michelle. Again, thank you for inviting me. This is a good opportunity for us to connect in this type of forum. Obviously, um, you know, having known you for so many years, I think more like 19 or so years, Ooh. something like that. So, uh, yes, it's uh, it goes way back, um, you know. My name is Ann Bao. Um, I'm currently the uh, Chief Operating Officer at Fairgene. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 31 years. Uh, you really um, background and uh, early career in immunology before I went into uh, the pharmaceutical industry and then spent some time at two big companies, then uh, after which I went on uh, to spend some time at a medical device company as well uh, before rejoining the biotech uh, world again. Uh, uh, running a uh, a company that was focused on bladder cancer, which is uh, currently what I'm doing again here now. Amazing, amazing. So, talk to us about this journey that you've had, this leadership journey. You know, I love to get people um, to give them a sense of who I have on the show. And when we're talking about leading during COVID, I think it's important that people understand your, you know, maybe your most memorable leadership experience in your journey that you think really shaped you, who you are. Yeah, and uh, and I apologize for the technical difficulties. I think all of us that have been operating in the age of COVID have experienced one technical issue or another yeah. throughout our uh, journey through COVID. And, and I think it's coming upon a year since most everybody that shut, kind of shut down uh, this weekend. Uh, and, and I would say, you know, from a leadership journey, I think it started early. Um, you know, when I was in college, um, I was fortunate enough uh, to be my fraternity president. There's nothing like a role like that uh, when you're young, uh, leading a group of other young folks, some of which are younger than you, most are older than you in my case. Uh, and really that experience shaped, you know, uh, how leaders ought to act in terms of how to engage people, how to work with people, how to work with people who are younger than you, how to work with people who are older than you, what type of messages resonate with them, how to engage with them, how to work with them and touch them as well uh, to make sure that you're moving forward in terms of the direction of how your organization needs to do and uh, going forward. So I think that was kind of really a good foundational block for what I ended up doing in the future. You know, mm -hmm. now I've been in leadership, fortunately, since 1995 in some shape, way or form of leading a team, uh, a project or leading an organization of folks, an entire enterprise of folks. So I've been very fortunate to have had that experience. And from each one of those experiences, I've learned something different, an approach that would work, uh, you know, better that I take on to the next person that I work with or lead, whether within the same organization or in future organizations. Uh, I think all those experiences are things that we should count on, build upon, and move forward. So from each role, I've taken the good, and what's mm -hmm. not so good, I've put yeah. aside, and moved on to the next. That's awesome. I, I can relate to that. I mean, I feel like you know, some of the most challenging experiences, some of the most difficult leaders that I've had taught me what it looks like to not be a good leader and what not to do. So you're right, it's about sort of taking all of it and it's good and it's bad and packing it and being able to leverage it for future roles. I, I love that. Um, so we're talking a little bit, you know, I wanna talk a little bit about this pandemic and about leading powerfully during the pandemic. You know, it's such a unique time where many people are um, 
you know, working from home, there's a lot of issues with balance and people are being pushed in different directions. So from a leadership perspective, how have, have you or how can leaders, in your opinion, strike that balance between fulfilling on deliverables? Because like you said, you're the chief operating officer. I am quite sure you have really aggressive deliverables to meet. How do you meet those, but also make sure you're looking after your people during such a crazy time, such a challenging pandemic? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. It's not easy. And I think everybody kind of came to their own version of how they engage and, and interact with their respective team members. Many people really were never even comfortable about working with video, working with audio, working via Zoom, via WebEx, and so on and so forth. And now we've all you know, got adjusted from kids all the way to adults in the yeah. workplace, using that as our primary source of engagement. And it's extremely hard. So communications are actually very challenged during those times. So, you know, what I would say, you know, during the pandemic, and I think there's been a lot of starts and stops in terms of really ensuring that an organization is able to continue to deliver, is really putting together a dashboard that allows everybody to see where everyone is, that puts kind of a carrot in front of people, but not really waving that or using that, you know, as a, as a, some type of, you know, um, punishment or something to actually push upon folks, but really showing them, these are our goals. Working together, we can reach those goals, that's one. Your role and responsibility in your attaining the goal is X as well. So identifying that for them. And then not only doing it in a group setting, you know, I've had a tremendous amount of discussions one-on-one, -on -one, just normally even on the phone. Yeah. Every call does not have to be a Zoom call. Every call doesn't have to be a WebEx. I think we've used the phone less and less throughout this period, in my opinion. And so just reaching out to folks and really ensuring that they're engaged with it and identifying what else is going on in their environment, mm -hmm. understanding. So it's not just a transactional type of discussion mm -hmm. that you're having yeah. with someone on your team or someone you're working with, but really based on mutual respect, understanding what they're going through, spending the time and saying, you know, how are you handling things? Yeah. What's going on in your world? You know, uh, I know we have to do X, Y, and Z. Is this the appropriate time to doing it now? When can you do, work on that? Yeah. You know, and I, as we've seen, people are delivering things at different times because yeah. they've got other commitments, balancing yeah. all your other commitments, whether it's kids, whether it's your animals, yeah. whether it's others within your family, whether you're a caregiver, all of those things we have to take into account. It's a very compound type of issue that we have to understand as leaders to help our people go through this process. Yeah. You know, I think about so many industries that have been affected in the way that they are traditionally used to deliver, or used to do the work that they knew to do. And so change is really prominent these during these times. Is, is there any anything that you would adv advise around helping people adapt to new ways of working, like completely new ways of working, because the old ways of working are no longer going to help or no longer even possible, maybe? Yeah, I mean, in terms of new ways of working, I, I think each person adapts to it on their own level. I think you have to personalize as a leader, personalize your approach, you know, for that individual person's needs. Some, you know, for example, at the company, we've supported individuals to actually have monitors at home, for example, have the right setup at home, right? If they need a tabletop to do a stand up on there, you know, all those things, all those things you may think they're little, but it's really to help them better accommodate the change that we've had to adapt and gone through. I think we're forever changed yeah. through this period that we've gone through. And I think what we will look at in terms of not only work-life balance, but also where I work, yeah. is also dramatically different as, yeah. as you mentioned you know and being in the industry that i'm in this industry has really stepped up you know and actually contributed to the recovery in terms of whether it's vaccines whether it's actual additional manufacturing resources that other companies are doing so we're the forefront 
of trying to help to deliver a solution to this issue that we've gone through. You know, and you raised a good point about um, work-life balance. And so if you uh, if you follow any of the, the data and any of the reports that you're seeing in like the news or even in LinkedIn, burnout amongst yeah. people working from home is, is incredibly high right now because people aren't taking vacations, people are working around the clock, there's deliverables. What do you think is important about setting expectations so employees are caring for themselves during this time? Um, could you repeat what you just said, uh, Michelle? Sorry. Yeah, I'm sure. Sorry. So I, with burnout, right? Like, I guess mm -hmm. when it comes to um, employees setting boundaries and setting, um, you know, routines, it, it's highly likely that we're going to see a lot of employees burning out because they're working around the clock. They, they're not taking vacations. So what, what do you think is important? I mean, is it modeling good behavior for creating uh, structures for people to help them now that they're working from home? What do you recommend around the prevention and, and the caring of people before they actually burn out? Yeah, I, I think as leaders, uh, you know, it's important to check in with the team. It's important to engage them and know, you know, to my earlier comment, what they're going through. Uh, you know, it's important to identify what their world looks like today and tomorrow as well. So I think working and knowing and being in close touch with the team is, is really paramount to success. You know, you and I were talking before we went live about uh, you have uh, family members that are in the mental health space, and that mm -hmm. is the space I'm very passionate about and wanting to help people before they before they um, hit crisis. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. We were talking about loneliness. We were talking about the PTSD that's going to come out of this COVID experience sure. and how they're already yeah. treating people with PTSD. What are your yeah. thoughts around, you know, and then we were also talking about the single people navigating this and the loneliness. Of course. So is, is it more of like an employer just sort of checking in on the people that are specifically navigating by themselves? No, I, I think it's about everyone has their own set of variables and issues they're dealing with. You know, whether yeah. you're single, whether you're you're taking care of a loved one at home, whether you're taking care of your own kids, a spouse and so on. Just the juggling and balancing of all of those things. I think single individuals who are at home have a different set of variables that they're dealing with. Uh, just yeah. the utter loneliness of being virtual all yeah. the time for a significant mm -hmm. amount of time does pose things today and probably years to come, you know, in my discussions yeah. with my siblings who are uh, mental health professionals, as I mentioned, that's really some of the crust of the issues that they're dealing with. <sighs> Yeah, I guess I'm thinking too about um, the importance of like, how do you maintain a culture when everybody is virtual? Like, how do you maintain that connection and have people not um, not feel like they've lost that um, relationship with each other, right? Like, I think like you said, work as we know it has completely been transformed. So a virtual, um, community is probably going to be a factor of some kind moving forward. But like, how can leaders maintain that connection and, and preserve their culture, a culture that probably a lot of people um, felt connected to prior to the pandemic and might be feeling like a little lost? Yeah, I mean, maintaining a culture of, or even building an organization, there are many organizations that were set up. I mean, we, we hired a, a large volume of folks, for example, during the pandemic and and building a culture in a virtual way is extremely hard. I think you have to push forward and try new things such as virtual get togethers with the team, you know, game nights with the team, uh, small groups, large groups, competition. We had poker night, for example, we had virtual yeah. cocktail hours. All, awesome. all of those types of activities, I think, are necessary to try to bring folks together uh, we had a costume night, for example, one time, you know, that, you know, people had to wear costumes and show up and those kind of things. I think all those things play a big role in what culture you want to bring forth within your organization, especially if it's forming. If, if it's existing already, you try to take some of the things that you used to do, um, you know, in an in-person setting and an offline 
uh, you know, manner. So what was it like hiring all those people and them not being able to meet one another? Um, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, I think you try to make connections and try to set up venues in which those connections can happen. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can only imagine. I mean, I, it's always been like every company I've ever gone to work for, there's always been like the lunch or the face-to-face -face meeting to welcome someone onto the team. And this is a completely different animal, right? Where you're having a yeah. new team formed in a virtual yeah. environment. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So is Fair Gene going to, and I, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but like I think a lot of companies are thinking about what is the future workspace? Are you going to have some sort of return to work or return to the office kind of thing? And, and um, how do organizations in your opinion, like how did they prepare for that? I, I, I wonder yeah, about that. I, mean, I think the final workplace setting, we don't fully know because I think yeah. You know, one thing I've heard other colleagues in other industries, including in our industry, especially if you're building a new footprint, it's probably smaller than what you did. It's probably going to be a mix from work from home slash work from the office. I think what well, that's what the future will probably be. There are some functional positions that you just can't do that. Manufacturing, for example, if you are doing, you know, drug manufacturing or or mm -hmm. you're on an auto line, you know, they're still going to need you. It's not like you can work from home. But I right. think of many uh, white collar type of positions, uh, you know, there'll be a balance, you know, there, there'll be a, there'll be a balance of those types of activities that will be done, you know, between, you know, I've and, and home. And I think there'll be an initial bolus, for example, post everybody, you know, most adults getting vaccinated into coming into the fall, there may be a bigger move to meet once again, just because there's a pent up demand for physical contact. Right. You know, with individuals that you know, engage and friends and, and so on that you have. So there will probably be that. Uh, but then you flip the other side of, you know, uh, what if there's a spike, you know, so there are many unknowns between now and then. So right. that's what I, I think it's, it's extremely hard to say, this is the plan. This is how we're going to follow. I, I think we're going to have to have science show us that, you know, we really have come around the bend on on COVID-19 and really then what do we do next? Yeah. And I know a lot of your work, Emboz, is um, around attendance of those larger congresses, those larger events. I wonder what the future of that is because so many of them were holding virtual like week-long events, right? Scientific sessions. Yeah. I, I think those those sessions that were attended by thousands of people um, you know, 5,000, 10,000 plus individuals from around the world. I don't know if those sessions will be similar. I think there'll be less and less because I think there will be the whole host of issues related to, for example, I'm not yet comfortable in getting together yes. in large group settings. You know, mm -hmm. I think I'm concerned about my safety, even if I'm vaccinated. What if they have a different strain and that, you know, my COVID-19 vaccine doesn't cover that strain? There's there's many different uh, things like that that people will go through um, that will make it extremely hard for them to be able to process and to be able to be engaged. I think, um, you know, 2022 is probably when uh, the concept of normal, I don't know, it'll be the new normal. I don't think it'll be, yeah. be 2019, you know, uh, repeated. I think it'll be different. You know, I think you will see pumps for antibacterial soap in every meeting and every corner, yeah. all those things that we are seeing today. I yeah. think you'll see it. I, you, you'll see it. And that makes the relationship building with key customers even di more difficult because I know face to face is how you build relationships with people, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's hard. And, and I yeah. think though the, industries that have to be engaged with customers. I think customers have also found ways to be engaged with people uh, in a virtual way now. They're more open to it. People who were never open to virtually engaging on a phone call or on a video chat or any of those types of settings are now much more open to doing it, but they do it with trusted individuals. 
Mm. Mean they may not necessarily just open up to everybody, but they would right. do it with individuals they feel like have earned their trust or they are credible because they were referred to them by somebody they trust. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, uh, engaging with customers in a virtual setting is a different world. It's a different approach. Um, yeah. And people um, sometimes really don't have the skills to doing it. Some of the things that we have done in the past is really virtual engagement skills. That's, yeah. that's a very important training that many people, whether they're young or even older, don't know because yes, we live in the FaceTime generation, but still we may not know to look straight in the camera or eye contact engagement, all those aspects of things that you would do, uh, not a lot of people would know. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. That That is a skill in and of itself. I mean, I have been learning that throughout this entire journey, absolutely. Yeah. So switching gears a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about your um, your many years of leading. And like, is there one or two instances in your leadership journey that really stand out to you that you could uh, reflect on that you would want to share? Um, really, I mean, there are many instances. I mean, I, I think you know, um, I read a book many years ago called Only the Paranoid Survive by Andy Grove, who is the former chairman and CEO of Intel, Intel that is in many people's computers throughout the world. And uh, he talked about a strategic inflection point in, in everyone's life, both personally and professionally, um, that they reach, you know, and that inflection point does dictate kind of what your trajectory is in life. So, you know, if there's something that I've learned um, is really making sure that we find that inflection point. Any advice I would give is that we really look for those inflection points to make those right calls in our respective lives so that both personally and professionally, um, we are satisfied long term. Okay, there's a lot of short term gain that people go for, but not seeing the, the future window of what that would be, meaning whether it's at a job, it's an opportunity, and whether that opportunity leads them eventually where to that inflection point. So those are the things I would say, um, you know, uh, I'm not answering your question directly, but I would say that yeah. I think that some inflection points, I think, are critical in one's life. So it's that's something that I would at least share with folks. Yeah, I love I love that because you're right. Oftentimes we get consumed in the short term gains and we don't think about the longer vision, the longer goal of what we really want. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point that you that you mentioned. Thank you for sharing that book. What was the name of the book again? Only the Paranoid Survive. Only the Paranoid Survive. Awesome. Yeah, okay. it's an interesting he, title. It's not it's not about paranoia, but he talks not about, about paranoia. There's a certain healthy paranoia one must have about their own performance, their own approach to life, and so on. So the, the, there's a story to it more than just paranoia. Got it. So any, as we start to wrap up, Amba, any other final words of wisdom that you would like to share with, with the leader out there who might be, you know, still trying to figure it all out and lead his, his or her team in a powerful way? You know, um, always begin with the end in mind. I would tell people, you know, think about where the destination is uh, in front of you. And it's a simple rule to live by. Do unto others as you'll do unto you. You will have done unto you. Uh, as a leader, if you keep that in perspective, the way you treat, the way you engage, the way you help, assist, and coach your team members will be tremendous. You know, I always talk to my team about an upside down organizational chart where I'm at the bottom and they're on top. The reason I mention that um is is really has to do with being really my primary role is to give them the resources to be successful in what they're doing and to help remove the obstacles in their way to succeed in their tasks and their activities and so on so as a leader yes there are many decisions we must make whether it's this resource this that resource for this project that project or this hire or that hire but ultimately having the right true north of doing the right thing 
by people and being there for your team is really what will drive you to success, whether it's in your first management job, your first leader job, leadership role, or you're on your fifth or tenth low role. Thank you so much, Ambo. Thank you for giving me some of your time today for sharing your wisdom. It was so great to have this chat with you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for making the time. No worries. Talk to you soon.